Welcome, everyone. Um, this is very nice to see so many of you here. Uh, we don't have any snow tonight, so that worked out very well for us. Um, I am Jennifer Mr. Munson. I'm the new uh, executive director here at the Armenian Museum of America. And I would like to welcome everyone here to the Armenian Museum to join us in this important discussion as we partner with Clark University's Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research to present Tanner Akhtam and his important new book. I would like to thank you all for joining us here at the museum to focus on this timely conversation. I would like to thank Mary Jane Rain and uh, Steve uh, Mikrodichan and Mark Magonian uh, for their partnership in this event. And I would also like to say thank Michelle Collegian, president of our board of trustees, for her strong leadership and for making this possible. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and I would like to say, thank our staff, particularly Stephanie Garofalo, for her assistance in uh, uh, planning tonight's event. This is my eighth week here as executive director, and I am thrilled to be part of this institution and immersed in the complex and fascinating history of Armenian people. In the coming months, you will see us transform as we reimagine galleries and displays to present elegant, inspired moments of understanding to present poignant narratives of Armenian experience around the precious objects in our collection. It is now my pleasure to introduce Steve Mikrodichan, a prominent trustee on our board, a co-founder of Corporate Environmental Advisors. In addition to his professional work and commitment here at the museum, Steve is an active volunteer on behalf of other numerous Armenian causes. He is chair of the Friends of the Robert Aram and Marianne Kaloutsian, and Stephen and Marianne Mugar Professorship at Clark University. He is also a deacon at the Armenian Church of our Savior, and I would like to welcome here to him here tonight to uh, present this important uh, conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. Your Armenian's getting better. So. <laughs> Stay with it. You said you've been here eight weeks, and eight months to be speaking Armenian. So. But um, thank you all for coming. I think most of you know who I am. I'm Steve Margaritian from Worcester. Uh, as you all know, as you all know, Watertown is, is known as Little Armenia. But don't forget, Worcester has a lot of history about the first Armenians. First Armenians that worked in the factories in Worcester, and Worcester also is home of the first Armenian church in the Western Hemisphere, the Armenian Church of Russia. So I don't want to take too much um, time away from our important uh, guest lecturer tonight. It's uh, good to see a number of you here today. About a week ago, uh, I was coordinating this event with Dr. Mary Jane Ryan from Clark. And she sent me a panicked email, Steve, um, I haven't heard any RSVPs from anyone. And I didn't have the heart to tell her, Armenians don't RSVP <laughs> or anything. So I said, but don't worry, Tanner is a big drawer with the Boston area Armenian group. And I just want to say, uh, on behalf of the three partners, uh, Clark University, uh, Nasser, and the Armenian Museum of, of America, we're fortunate to benefit from um, this particular evening and um, the program tonight will obviously highlight Connor's uh, most recent uh, investigation of archival evidence and I just want you to promote, I just want you to be aware of what we're doing at Clark is really teaching the next generation of scholars who will carry this essential work now and into the future about the history of what happened to the Armenians, the denialists from the Ottoman Turkish Empire, and more importantly, I think it's our ongoing 
um, responsibility to promote what we're doing, not just to America, government, but also to government and organizations around the world. So, uh, Dr. Aksham is a very busy, very short, small, stature professional. He's a busy guy. He's uh, got the energy of an 18-year-older. At um, the end of April, Professor Akcham will be traveling to Sweden to speak to the parliament. He will be in Paris. He will be in Beirut. He will be in Israel. He will be in Armenia. In the last month, he spoke in London and at Columbia University. So if you have friends that want to meet with Conair and you're not here tonight, well, maybe you can catch him at one of these worldly locations. So uh, he speaks at numerous uh, churches, universities. He's spoken at uh, several Armenian uh, cultural and brotherhood organizations like the Knights of Our Time. So we're lucky to have Dr. Aksham here. Uh, we invite you to write down questions, ask questions, engage in dialogue. And again, I just want to thank on behalf of all of our collective sponsors and you, the audience, I want to thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.
through the focused efforts of the Turkish state, had been reduced to the status of discredited forgeries that real scholars should avoid. Now, as it happened, this had the salutary effect of forcing researchers to seek out other sources, including as they became available, Ottoman archival sources. And in due course, scholars, not least among them, obviously, Akhtar have moved on and generated reams of documentation and analysis from a multitude of new sources, rendering the Andonian documents from a certain perspective, if not obsolete, then at least no longer as relevant as they once were. Yet, interestingly enough, the denialist establishment has continued to harp on the so-called false Andonian documents as evidence of an equally false so-called <coughs> Armenian genocide. By subjecting the Nine Bay Aram Andonian materials and the arguments used to discredit them to such close scrutiny and finding overwhelmingly and convincingly in his book that the evidence supports their authenticity, Connor has righted a significant historical wrong by taking a sledgehammer to a long-cherished denialist argument. But for all of that, again, I think the book's truly major contribution lies outside of the realm of genocide studies. There's a word and a field of study devoted to how we know things, how knowledge is produced, epistemology. Until quite recently, there was no word and no field of study of how ignorance is produced. Though there is now, largely thanks to the efforts of the scholar Robert Proctor of Stanford, and the word is agnotology, the study of the production of ignorance. Proctor's work is more within the realm of the natural sciences, but the Turkish state was a practitioner of ignorance production long before the word existed, and continues to be down to this day. More complex than denial in its most simple form that says this did not happen. It is an effort to cloud the discussion by actively promoting uncertainty in the debate, or what I call manufacturing doubt. One of its major undertakings in the early 1980s, when the modern era of scholarly, in quotation marks, denial of the Armenian genocide really got underway, was to discredit the Andonian and Nine Bay materials, thereby casting doubt on the entire subject of the Armenian genocide. But this strategy has been very effective in the context of the discourse on the Armenian genocide in American circles. Since as Isaac Asimov wrote, there's a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is as good as your knowledge. But it has also worked effectively in academia, where it has exploited not only the ideal of academic freedom, but also the post-structuralist turn that emphasizes the truth is a construct and that all narratives supposedly possess equal claims on truth. Well, with killing orders, Connor has taken us inside this process of doubt manufacture and ignorance production, and he brings us out the other side, having reversed the machinery, producing knowledge and facts. Let's hear how he did it. between fact and truth 
remains a hotly contested topic in the social sciences. As a rule, facts, opinions, and interpretations are considered as different things, separate from each other. We would like to believe that the truth rests upon established fact over which there is a consensus. As such, they are not the same thing as opinion and interpretation. They are totally different. We would also like to believe that the practice of denialism in regard to mass atrocities is a simple denial of the facts. But this is not the truth. This is not true actually. There is, rather, there is a nebulous territory between facts and truth, and denialism germinates from this territory. Denialism marshals its own facts and it has its own truth. I'll show you this. Over the century, since its occurrence, consecutive Turkish governments have succeeded in creating their own version of history and holding history hostage with their own documentary evidence and truth. In doing so, they have succeeded at the very least in broadly publicizing their own historical viewpoint, thereby raising it to the level of reasonable historical possibility. And you always do that, you hear that every day, that there are two sides of the story, we have to listen to both sides, and so on. With this effort, over the past decades, the fact-based truth, the Armenian genocide, has been discredited and relegated to the status of mere opinion of a group of individuals. The debates over denialism do not revolve around the acceptance or rejections of a group of accepted facts or a truth derived therefrom. Rather, they are a struggle for power between different set of facts and truths. So this is what I mean. The biggest difference between Holocaust denial and the Armenian genocide denial is the politique. Holocaust denial has no power. <coughs> but Armenian genocide denial has no power. United States, England, and the support of Israel, the big important power in our real, they are giving strength to Turkish government's denialist policies. So whoever who thinks that the fight with denialism is a fact, is a fight of the facts that we have to find the true documents is misleading. It is a power struggle. And as long as we cannot grasp the power and we cannot make our truth the powerful one, the powerful argument, the Turkish denialism will continue. What I mean is it is not only the job of academia to change this image. So the fight about truth is a fight about the power. This is my smallest, tiny message that I cannot, or we scholars cannot solve the problem the problem of the truth can solve only as a result of a power step. This is so simple. We can maybe deliver some arguments. This is one slide that I used in my uh, last talk, and it's very important and explains what I mean. From Michel Rolf Trulow, he's a uh, Chicago, he passed away, and the historians. He believed that the silence in the past happens through five moments. You can understand or read this as denialism. Denialism entered into the historical production in four, in five, four moments. I added the five. He wrote, number one, the moment of fact creation. This is the making the sources. Number two, the moment of fact assembly, the making of archives. Number three, the moment of 
fact retrieval, so the making of narrative, the narration. You develop a story based on your facts and your archives. And the fourth, the moment of retrospective significance to show that how important your history actually is for today, the making of a story in the final instance. And I added to this a fifth factor, the moment of destroying and proving the falsity of critical doctrine. So in my argument is that Armenian genocide denial is not denial of the facts. The denialism has its own fact. If every case of genocide can be understood as possessing its own unique character, then the Armenian case is unique among genocide in the long-standing efforts deny its historicity, historicity. And another characteristic, this is the main topic of my lecture actually, another characteristic of this century of denialism is that it has been an inherent component of the genocide. So this is it, uh, since the beginning of the event themselves. So in other words, my central argument, the denial of Armenian genocide began not in the wake of the event, but was an intrinsic part of the plan itself. And I will show you the examples. And the deportation and killing of Armenians were performed under the guise of decision to res resettle Armenians. The entire process was in fact organized and carried out in an effort to present this image. And we have enough facts and we have an archive to prove this. Here, a couple of examples. This is a document from Istanbul archive and related to Armenian intellectuals. The official documentation that presents the entire deportation and extermination as a legitimate resettlement began to be produced from the very first day of deportation. In other words, what the law has described as the moment of fact creation, the making of sources, began, if not earlier, on April 24, 1915, which serves as the symbolic date marking the beginning of Armenian Genocide. And one striking example relates to the 200 Armenian intellectuals who were arrested on the evening of April 24 in Istanbul. Ottoman archive today, full of documents reporting that these Armenian intellectuals who were arrested in Istanbul were perished from heart attacks, very normal health issues, or other natural causes, or alternatively that they fled or were released at some point. This is a document related to four Armenian intellectuals, you all know them. One is Agnoni, one of the, the writing is a little bit different in Turkish version, I put it the original version. Agnoni, one of the leader of Dashnak student party, and the teacher of Hayak, it says in the document, and Aron Yardanyan, and the famous Armenian intellectual Daniel Borushi. The document says they all escaped to Russia on the way to the other. This is an official Ottoman document. Yusuf Sadenay, the director of general of Ottoman archives, he was earlier the general archive of the Ottoman government, uh, Turkish government, he wrote an extensive article based on only Ottoman materials in the archive and showing the originals of the documents also, he came to the conclusion that only, as you know, when the Armenians were arrested in Istanbul, they were sent to central Anatolia, to Ayash, very close city next to Ankara, and Chankara, in two different prisons, and they were settled there, and then afterwards they were taken in group and killed on the base. And this is the story I think you all know about Armenian intellectuals. And in, based on Ottoman materials, he came to the conclusion that only 20, 
nine of these Armenians kept in Chankere, in one of the prisons, and 35 of them were found innocent and returned to Istanbul. 31 were pardoned by the government and allowed to go to any city they wanted, and 57 were deported. They saw that they became free individuals afterwards, and three foreigners, the Armenians who has the citizenship of other countries, they were expelled uh, out of Ottoman Empire, so they were sent out. And then, at the end, he claims that none of these intellectuals was the subject of murder. Another document from Ottoman archive, again, this is related to Krikor Zohrab. You all know about Krikor Zahrab, one of Armenian leading intellectuals in Istanbul, and you also know that he was arrested uh, first mid of June in Istanbul, and he was sent to Diyarbakir, and very close, the city of Diyarbakir, his head was crushed with a stone, he was killed along with other Armenians on the way. We know this story extensively. This is an Ottoman document, it's a doctor report, official doctor report, that says follow: In Urfa, before leaving the city Urfa towards Diyarbakir, a doctor checked Zohrab and discovered heart disease, and the next day he passed away, and doctor went to the place of the death and prepared this report, and saying that uh, Zohra had died of heart attack. You think that, ah, they made up this, but there were other testimonies. An important testimony, eyewitness account, was the Armenian priest from Ur. He was also taken to the scene, and he gave the testimony, and there is a signature under this testimony of this Armenian priest, saying that Father Ayrabet had been called to see where the disease was found, how the doctors examined the body <coughs> and determined that Zohrab had died of heart attack, and how then Zohrab had been buried according to appropriate religious customs. This is another official document. I will talk about them later also. It says, in this interior minister, says that Zohrab passed away as a result of an accident on the way from Urfa to the other. And the government informed Zohrab's wife in Istanbul that her husband had died of a heart attack, and on July 21st, 1915, an official statement was published in the daily newspapers that Zohrab passed away as a result of a heart attack. Turkish government never used this in their denialist argument. This is another topic we can go in question and answer there. But based on facts and archival documents, I can prove you that Zohrab was not killed. He passed away as a result of an heart attack. We have back the report, we have a uh, report of Armenian priest, and we have newspaper coverages, and the Zohrab's wife's testimony, if necessary, they say that the government informed me about that. So you have facts against facts. This is the major problem, and you can solve this only, of course, with a political power structure, the most important part. So this is what you know and what I discussed last time here, and this is the Andonion's book, uh, other method that uh, Trudeau was talking about, the moment of destroying or attempting to disprove the authenticity of critical documents. Aram Andonion's publication of Naim Effendi's memoir was one of these kind of documents, and I spoke on that topic extensively, so I'm going to skip, uh, skip all these. Uh, so the, in 1983, as you see here, Turkish Historical Society published uh, a book on the Talat Pasha's uh, telegram, and since 1983, we hardly use Naim Andonion's memoir uh, in Scarlet the World, because we also kind of believe that they were fake or produced by Armenians. So 
for the extensive story you can read in my book. I'm not going to discuss uh, in detail. So uh, what I showed in the uh, in book, in my killing order, that, uh, that indeed there is an official exists with the name Naim Efendi, and he wrote his memoir, and the events of which he writes were real events, and so on and so forth. And I also proved that so-called argument, it was one of the arguments that the using of the line paper, here as you see, uh, this line paper is a proof of forgery, and I showed in my book extensively, this also showed the authenticity. And one argument in that book was using two-digit uh, calling system was fabricated by Armenians, and this is an Ottoman document with two-digit, uh, so it shows that these documents were authentic. As I said, I discussed extensively this in my previous uh, lecture, so I'm not going to talk on this. Only among these disputes, two points were remained. Let me repeat again. Turkish Historical Society, for those who hadn't been the opportunity to listen to previous lectures. Turkish Historical Society made three major claims. Number one, there is no such an individual Naim Bey. Number two, there is no such a memoir. We don't have the originals. Number three, so-called telegrams, original telegrams, are all produced, they are all fake, done by Armenians. And in my book, I show that there is a bureaucrat with the name Naim Bey, I published the official Ottoman documents related to the existence of this individual. Number two, there is a memoir. The original facsimile is in my book. You will see some uh, images of that memoir. And uh, that Naim Bey existed. Uh, I have to add, until 2015, April, we were not aware the existence of this memoir was gone. This is another story in question and answer theory. I can go into detail. So the number three, the important third argument of the Turkish Historical Society's book was that the telegrams were fake on 12 ground. They had 12 arguments. And two important one was, one was that the dates on the documents were wrong. I will deal with this evening, what it means. And number two, the signatures under the documents are fake. I never discussed these two aspects in previous lectures, and this, is, this was not also included in my Turkish book. So in the English book, there is a special chapter deals with the problems of dates and signatures of these telegrams. These are the strongest arguments for the wrongness of this telegram. So, the question is whether or not signatures are original, whether or not dates are original or fake, they were created by Armenians. The central argument about these telegrams was that, or generally, these telegrams were produced as a part of a smear campaign against Turkey and that the telegrams allegedly shows the killings order of Armenians. So then this is the quote from both the Armenians and the Armenian chief among them have produced the documents, these telegrams, and uh, with the whole aim to tar all Turks with the same shameful branch. And they also argued, the Oral and Yuja, the writer of this Turkish book, that they closely examined these telegrams and proved the falsity of these words. Two misperceptions emerged from this book. I think most of you think the same way. Number one, I mean, this is uh, not so important. Maybe telegrams are produced by Armenians because I showed that in the book that it's not by Armenians. 
it's given indeed by Manube, but number two, this is the new information for you all. You or we all think that these telegrams signed by the governor contain orders to kill Armenians. This is a legend. This is a totally surprise. This was a total surprise for me. This is the very important argument related to authenticity of these telegrams. So, as you know, why Naim Bey's memoir was important, why Antonio published his book 1922, because Naim Bey's memoir contains killing orders of Talatash. It's true. Naim Bey has in his memoir handwritten copies of 52 telegrams. And some of them are killing orders. And here is the list for them. Within this, in this memoir, there are 52 handwritten copies. And I counted, there are eight documents directly contains the, the uh, killing order to annihilate the army. And two of these documents are with the three-digit method and have photographic images. This is number one. This is what Andonian published in his book. As you see, there is no sign of government. This is coming from Istanbul. A telegram with three-digit coding system and says, Union and Progress Party decided to completely annihilate all Armenians. And this is the second two-digit document. Again, no governor's signature. It has nothing to do with governor coming direct from Istanbul. And we don't know the, what this telegram contains. We only know because Naim really copied this. And meanwhile, of course, we can decode this telegram also. So, Two of these eight killing orders are three-digit method, and they have photographic images. I showed you the photographic images. And you know, for the six documents, no photos. There is no images available. And four of these six documents are found in the version of the memoirs that I possess, and two in Andonians. So Andonian version of memoir was not similar, exact same as Naim Bey's memoir. But short story is there were eight killing orders in the memoir, and we have only images of two. And none of them, none of these deciphered documents bearing the signature of Mustafa Abdul Hadi Renda, this is the governor. So you will see, I will show you the other documents also. There is, this is the surprising result, this is the surprising discovery. There is no need really to reproduce to, to these false documents. I will show you this so-called false document by one one. There are 12 telegrams that contains signature of governors. So, we are talking about 12 telegrams with signature of governors, and the Turkish Historical Society argued 1983 that these signatures are fake and produced, these documents produced only to really blame the Turks for the atrocity. There are 12 telegrams. 10 is mentioned in Andonion's memoir or in Naim Bey's memoir that I have. Two are not mentioned, and they are in Bogos Nubal Library in Paris today. I'll show you the originals also. You know, five of these, so in the book, we have seven images. So in Andonion's book, we have seven images of governor's signature, seven photographic images. So additional five, I have them now, 
we, we are thankful to Grigor Gergel because some of these documents are gone. They are not available in Paris Bogos Library. Like only two of them are shown. So, seven documents, images published in that book. We never gave the effort at time, I mean, when the book was published by Antonio and later during the book, to read these documents. You know, five of these seven deals with the women and children. No killing for them. I will show you some examples. Similar documents you can find, dozens of them in Ottoman archive. And seven of, one of seven discusses to make their zor a site for Armenian resettlement. You can find also dozens of similar documents in Ottoman archive. And Armen American consuls, one deals with American consuls' activities. Three of ten documents that I have the images were not used by Antonio, which we have the, I have the images, I will show you the images. One is a request of previously asked document. I will show you. Talat says in Telegram, I asked you to send me a Telegram document in April, in September, why you are not going to send me, send it to me. This is it. And the other Telegram, and uh, the demand that persons be prevented from taking photographs along the deportation routes, and the third instructs that any telegrams and complaint by Armenian deportees be submitted in the place which they are arriving. This is this was for me also an amazing discovery. There was no need to produce this stuff. <coughs> so. Uh, Again, there would be no good rational for fabricating these documents and similar communication can be found in Ottoman. And these two documents that I was talking about, uh, uh, that they are in Bogos Dubai Library, they are related to Krikor Zohra. And I showed you one original, I will show you. And one says about the accident that the Greek or Zohra died as a result of an accident. And if you are an Armenian and want to produce uh, documents for the genocidal intent of Ottoman authorities, why you should produce a document just prove the opposite? That Zohra was not killed, but he was passed away because of an accident. And the other telegram, so-called fake telegram, is a simple telegram asking where did, uh, when did uh, Zohra arrived in uh, Aleppo, in which hotel he stayed, and when he left the city. So there is really no rational, rational, rational for fabricating these materials. Some example. This is it's an important uh, information uh, for you. This is the Naive's memoir. And this is the original that he gave later to Antonio. This part, as you see, when he was hand copying, he was making some mistakes, scratched them, and this is exactly the same. And the telegram is about Armenian woman and says, uh, we hear that a lot of Ottoman Turkish Muslims, they are getting married with Armenian women. Stop this practice. <coughs> and there are similar dozens of documents in Ottoman archive today. And the debate is about this signature that I'm going to talk about. So the debate is about this signature, and they claim that this is a fake signature. So this is another example, Armenians wrote <coughs> orphan about the Armenian orphans. This is from the memoir, and this is the original of the document. And it says, you know, put these, uh, those Kids who cannot remember what happened to their parents, uh, included, they include them to deportation convoys. Don't really uh, give a special effort for them. They should continue with deportation. And this is another fake document. It says, send the Armenian orphans to Sivas, to Sakestia, Sakestia. I mean, what is the reason to produce this document? It says that sent Armenian orphans 
from Syrian region to Sebastian. This is the document about. So there is no reason to produce this document also. This is another so-called fake document. This is from the memoir, and this is the original, and Antonio didn't use this in his book. We are thankful to Krikor uh, Zohra that he filled this when the document was available in Bogos Mobile Library in Paris. Today it's not available. So this is about the petitions of Armenians. It has nothing with killings, it's just, just the opposite. Yes, it says, take the petitions, but not where the Armenians are now, in their final destination, new places of residence. They should submit their petitions, complaint petitions, in, in new places. This is the document. <coughs> and this is another fake document that Antonio didn't use in his book. Antonio thought it's that important. Why should I print the facsimile of the original of this document? This is from memoir. And it says, please organize and send within one week the documents requested in the secret communication 1923. This is the number of documents, take 8 of the document. This it. I asked you in a secret document to send me some documents to you. You didn't send yet, you haven't sent yet, you yet, then send me now. This is the document to follow. And this is another document that I mentioned. The Istanbul deputy Kirikor Zohrab Efendi died as the result of an accident befall him by travel. How can one claim that such a document is a forgery? It could be used to disprove Zohrab was murdered. And this is another claim since 1983. As I said, based on also this signature, but Turkish Historical Society and the authors, they haven't seen these two signatures. And this is another document, the last one, inquire at which hotel the deputy Krikor Zohra presides in and for how long, and at which date he was removed from Aleppo and informed according. Look. This is one of the important issues for us. This is again governor's signature. If I go back, you will see this is the governor's signature. Don't worry, I will make a forensic debate with you on that issue. So this is the governor's signature again, and it says only we ask the information about the book. The other question is, does the dates on... So now my strongest argument is, there is no need to produce this book. If you go to Orton Archive today, you can find similar documents in the archive. What heck Naim Efendi should sit down and create these documents? Some of them even can prove as uh, used as a proof that, genocide, that there was no genocidal intent of Ottoman authorities. So this is the strongest argument. And regarding the telegram. This is the telegram that they talk in their book. The date is 16th September 1915, and this is the signature of governor, and this is the sign here, very important. It refers that the signature was done almost the same day around the uh, 16th September. The argument is the following. Governor Mustafa Abdul Halik Renda appointed to Aleppo beginning of November, October. He arrived Aleppo November 7th, 8th, around 1915. And only showing this one document, Turkish Historical Society's argument is following. How a government can sign a document that dates 16th September when he arrived in the area first beginning of November? He signed a document that two months earlier, and he writes under this document same month with this the, the impression, this, this notification that it happened the same month. What I discovered, of course, that Oral and Yuja didn't pay enough attention 
there was actually not one document that has a date, predated that the government's arrival. There were five different documents, not only one. So, governors signed five documents from September 1915, October 1915, even though he arrived in the area November. And why can we consider this as fake? My arguments are following, that these dates are not fake. Number one, in his memoir, Naim exactly mentions when he started working. After a couple days of governors arrival to Aleppo, we know we can date, it is around 8 or 9th of November he arrived, and then Naim says, I started working. He already knew, so he could not produce a document, not only one, he produces five documents that predated that, uh, then, uh, so, we can argue that Naim did not make this mistake. He knew when he started working. Number two, I have three examples for you. I will jump very fast. There are dozens of documents in the Ottoman archive today with wrong dates. So, wrong dates cannot be a proof of of falsity of a document. This is a document from Ottoman Archive, written 1st April 1915, <clears throat> April 1915, and in the document he asked the information about a telegram that he sent December 19. You can say that this is a false document, this is produced, because December is six months later after April. So this is another document. You have various things. The document is from 1st December, written, and mentions an event of 13th December, two weeks afterwards. And even it has a date, 31st November, which never exists in Canada. <laughs> Oh. So we can argue that this is also a fake. Another document, 24 February 1332, this is, it should be 24 February 1916. You know what? This date doesn't exist in Ottoman. It's a complicated story, but for your information, Ottoman government jumped from 16th February to 1st March. You know the old date, there is 13 days difference between Ottoman calendar and the Gregorian modern calendar. In order to solve that problem, 16th February 1332, they jumped to 1st March 1333. So you don't have 14 days, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 February, 1332 does not exist in Ottoman calendar. And there are really dozens of calendars because mistakenly people wrote these dates and this is the date. So based on this, I can argue that these documents are all fraudulent. <coughs> the fourth argument that I have, third argument, the content of these documents, predated documents. As I mentioned, it was re it's requesting a document that governor, the, I'm sorry, interior minister was asking to resend a document. This is on the slide 22. I showed you already, but I can uh, show you again uh, request of document. This is the document, and the date is 25th October, and governor was not in, uh, of course, Aleppo during that period. And uh, there are other government, in this, the other documents are also the same, related to Kirikor Zohra Efendi's dies as a result of accident, and again, the about the hotel. So, there is only now <coughs> one important thing that we have to explain. 
why that government signed this document if he arrives to run? Very simple, actually. In bureaucracy, it happens. Because beginning of September, the previous governor was removed from the office. There was nobody as uh, act as governor, and there was a cousin, a judge, representing the governor, and we checked all his uh, telegrams. He was responding to Istanbul. He was only uh, giving answer to certain documents when he was asked explicitly. All other materials he was leaving there. And when the new governor came, of course, to office, first thing that he did was went over the old unsigned documents. So there are two other important issues. One is the signature of, or the last issue is the signature of the government on the documents, whether they are fake or not. This is the forensic work, I told you. But we come to that. These are the signature from Naim Amdonian books. This is, these are three examples of the signature Governor Mustafa Afin Halik in autumn materials. And these are the governor's signature that we have in the autumn archive, second department, a specific department, because he had time to sign this document. These are not ciphered telegrams, these are very normal written letters. As you see, <coughs> there is a slight difference between these two signatures. And based on this argument, they said all these signatures are fake, produced by Nahim, and they are false. They cannot be trusted. They are wrong. You will be surprised. This is a list of the signatures of the government that I discovered in the archive. So, here is the simplest explanation. This is the signature list from second department of Autumn Archive, where he signed all these documents. He is, all this, he says, Halep Walisi, the governor of Aleppo. And uh, as you see, this is the, from Republic period of the same. The ending are different, but these are from the second department. And these are the telegrams that we have in Naim Bey's memo, Naim Bey's document. This is the document from Bobo's Dubar Library, and these are the other signatures. This last three volume, these are the documents from Cypher Office of Interiors. They are also original documents of governors. And this is also official signature of governors. And this is also official signature of <coughs> There are at least 10 different ways of signatures that he was using. So one is from second department, one is the cipher of his signatures, and the last one is from the military archive publications. I discovered these signatures. There are several questions. So, very actually important. His, why he has so different signatures? One explanation is very simple. His name is Mustafa Abdul Halik, who knows Arabic, can understand that actually this round here comes closer to Mustafa than he writes very fast. And the other is the very short summary of Abdul Halik, second. Part of his signature. So sometimes he used both parts in Naim's memoir and in his second <coughs> department, but most of the time he used only the second part, Abdul Hadi, as his signature. If you look closely, you will find some interesting information. Number one, why? I mean, first important thing is this governor was using several different signatures. Why? I don't know. I cannot explain this. We can speculate about why he was using so many different telegrams. We can have psychological explanations or other explanations of this. If you look all these signatures, you would argue that these two were the closest to each other. Based 
some Turkish historical societies argue, you could say, look, these are also from second department. This is Abdul Hamid. This is what his name. And it is totally different from others. His signature. Why we have so many signatures of this government? Because he was working in foreign uh, in interior ministry between 1916-17, and he had to sign almost each side of documents before going to the uh, office for the uh, side. So I have more than 150 signatures of this government. And I have to pick up. There are so many different ones. And these are really the signature of the same guy. They, he was signing the same document. So why Naim Bey's documents cannot be forged? One simplest reason is this. Look, this is the documents <coughs> signed by Mustafa Abdi that I showed, published by Antonio. And this is what I discovered in Paris Fogos Dubai from same government. They are not identical. How somebody wants to produce false document can create two different signatures. Why Naim should create two totally different signatures to each other? It doesn't make sense. It can only be explained by the authenticity. And the other important <coughs> issue, look here, this shows, this was for me really very important. This is one of the signatures that he uses in his document. It shows to me that he used the second part of signature consciously and omitted the first part. Look here what it is on the origin. This is exactly this part, this round part, and he suddenly noticed and he scrapped this, scratched this, and then this, uh, wrote this with his own signature, continues with second. And looking all these other materials, we can hardly really argue that uh, Naim produced certain documents. He cannot produce two different signatures at the same time. And if you argue along the line of Turkish historical society, I would argue if this is the basic, all these documents are broken. There is no other explanation. So this is the issue related to soft signature. One, one last argument is the handwriting of government. These are three documents that we have. And in all these documents, we have handwriting of clerk and governors. This is how the mechanism works. When the cipher telegram comes from Aleppo, officers turn to decipher it, turn it into a text, and bring it to the government in front of the government. It says from the interior ministry and so on and so forth, and then Telegram had certain content, and the government write a referral under this document to which office it should go. And as you see, these handwritings are similar, and they are different from the main text of the telegrams. I have more image for you. These are the referrals that is written, and these are the handwritten by the clerks. They are different handwriting. And this is governor's writing from interior ministry when he was in office. This is his original handwriting we know because he was talking from first person in that document and with his signature. And this is the <coughs> writing from Bogos Nubar Library. The similarities between handwriting I want to show you. And this is Again, his document from the Interior Ministry, and these are the handwriting from the Andonio. <coughs> As you see, the signature here, this is one of the signatures that I use. This is the signature of Governor, and totally different. And this is the signature, this is the writing that we have in Bogos Mubar Library. These are the general's, uh, governor's handwriting from the military army. And I have also you, here you can compare with governor's handwriting in Bogos Duban Library. And 
This is again the same handwriting from one is the military archive and the other is from the Bobos Mubarak Library. And these are some governor's handwriting along with uh, the official documents that I discovered and this is the uh, image that I uh, published in the English book. So, conclusion. The referral notes on all the documents appear to resemble one another. They are the same. You can really check very closely. And the referral notes are very different than of the text of the document. And if you look at these ten documents that is published by Nahim, the handwritings among them, they are also different from each other, which I didn't discuss now. And the handwritten letter from Ottoman archive and two referral notes belonging to the governor in military archive publications are similar. And as I mentioned, the handwriting in the main text really differs from difference from each other. And it shows, among other things, that deciphering of the documents was performed by different Ottoman officials, of course. It makes also sense. So to imagine that Nahim possess the ability to write, to write in four or five different handwriting styles, and that he employed the skill to produce forged documents containing these styles is the stuff of conspirational through mind. But I think these are not the sort of claims that can or should be taken seriously. There is a simple thing. These are very normal, authentic documents. The difference between governor's first signature, because he had time to sign this document. And in other case, the document was coming, he was signing, signing and giving. So simple, actual paper. And the person who wanted to produce fake document would never think to produce different signatures. Did <laughs> So all this shows actually us one thing. Denialism is really a very tough issue. It is not only simply denying the fact. It really creates its own facts and truth. And of course, as academicians, we can try and develop some Sherlock Holmes job and prove the falsity of certain documents, but believe me, it is the job of politicians. It is the job of politicians to make our truth the powerful truth. Thank you. So simple. The difficulty is for them to accept it. 
truth is not so complicated. It is, it is the reason that the documents are not perfect. Because it is the real life. This is, look your own signatures when you sign your checks or your letters and so on. How many different signatures? So, uh, but the main problem was that we were scared. We didn't have the origins of these materials. And when we read the book, we were really overwhelmed with the way of argumentation of the documents. And we gave up, actually, in, in all these big arguments. Actually, if we really start here, it is actually so simple. So simple. And we can solve this problem. I think my main argument is, again, it's the politique. It is the politique that corners us. And I hope in the book, at least one of the central arguments of Turkish government cracks up. This was their major political argument. It was, for, for us scholars, we had not other evidences to show the genocidal intent. But this was the strongest political argument of Turkish government. Along with the memoir, along with the Nahim Efendi and so on, I think the facade of the Turkish political demands get a strong hit here. And it is the job of those who are fighting for the truth and justice to make this an issue in their country. Well, my question for you uh, tonight is, do you know of any other genocides that you compare this method of denialism to? And has this ever happened in history before where the government has all the documents like this that you can point to as examples? It is an excellent question. We might have, I don't know, from all denialist rhetoric that I know, denialism was produced or is produced mainly after the genocide happened. I, I want to be very cautious about it. There might be some other cases where they really started from the scratch to create the other truth. There might be cases because human mind works in a similar way. The important question is why Turkish government started creating such a facts and archive from the early beginning? This is an important question, and then I discussed this in my book. My dear Rohakim Dadrian would explain with these Turkish sinister minds that they are so serious, serious guys and so on, as a kind of a psychology or psych psychological makeup of terms. My explanation is, it's a preliminary explanation, is the weakness. They were a weak state and they had to explain everything that they have been doing to Armenians, to Germans. They were continuously under pressure and they had to convince, even during the genocidal process, the Germans and the Americans that the aim is not the exterminating the Americans. One explanation is the weakness of the Turkish state that they had to create this parallel truth. This made what Armenian genocide, I think, popular because it was a tremendous effort. And Indeed, well, I didn't discuss the other documents. It's in my introduction. I gave other examples. Amazing, amazing documentation. How they meticulously really created the other truth. And the other important issue that we should know: those truths actually were not total fabrication. I have a document, and I had a long discussion with Haji during Muratya, my PhD student. Is now a doctor, a document on the concentration camps. As you know, in the second phase of Armenian genocide, there have been concentration camps established in Syria, and then later Armenians in these camps were also exterminated. And 
There is a document, it has 55 separate articles that clearly describes how these camps should be organized. Which are the main camps, which are the transition camps, which are the last places. So a total plan of resettlement. And we discussed with Hajik a lot about this document. Because you can use this document as, you know, they made up to cover up certain issues. But if you read some memoirs, you would notice that really some of the aspects in these documents were the truth. For example, there were food ratio in concentration camp, indeed distributed as they wrote in these documents. There were indeed certain silos, how they called, where you put the foods, and there was important individuals from camp responsible for these food storages. And even in Armenian memoir, you read this. So what I mean is, the documents were not 100% fake. This is what I told you at the beginning. The truth has some places where denials and can journey. So the important thing is really to see that the fight with denialism is not only that the denialism denies certain facts, it should be really closed, and we have to look closer to each of the places, and we will see that truth is somewhere there and it needs strong interpretations. And this is where the politique really wins. Yes? No. We don't have any handwritten. Do we have Anna in the archive? Naim Bey's, uh, to my knowledge, Andonio never copied Naim Bey's memoir. He might have transliterated or transcribed, translated into Armenian. This is what he did and published in the book. So he actually has the original telegraphs? Of course, Andonion had, my guess, not guess, I mean, almost definite, 26 original documents from Naim Effendi. Ten of them was the signature and, and so on. So 27 documents was handed over by Naim Effendi to Andonion, and Andonion used only 14 of these 27 in his book and the memoir, and they are all gone. Because Andonion took, these are my previous lectures, so this is the reason that I am going to detail. Andonion took this material 1918 from, from uh, when he was in Aleppo, he came to Paris, he became the director of Bogos Nubar Library, who put this material there, and the materials were there, we don't know how long. We only know that the beginning of 1950s, when Antonio was alive, Krikor Gergerian went there and filled all these materials. And the first scholar that we know is Yuv Ternon. He went into Bogos Tuvar Library 1974-75. He couldn't find memoir and he couldn't find the originals. They are gone. I, 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 I've been telling all the time. If Gergeria hadn't filmed and copied these materials, I couldn't have given this lecture today. We are thankful to him. He made this all possible. Last question. Uh, in the Turkish history of the 19th century, there have been many massacres committed by Turks against neighbors, against uh, some of their own citizens, as we know. We know about the Armenian massacres. And uh, these are, you know, uh, maybe with genocidal intent, eventually, the same genocidal intent that you are now. You know, you've studied and you've been studying for so many years and done great work and uncovered 
how if you made any connection with any of those, and I don't mean just Armenians, it's other uh, foreign, other countries, other neighbors of Turks. And, and I know uh, I don't have the list in my mind, but in the 19th century there were many massacres committed by Turks. I've seen those. It's a very good question, a very important question. Thank you for asking. Actually, in scholarly world, we now tend to speak about a genocidal process. Until recently, we were talking on genocide as an event happened to Armenia in 1915-17. We tend to talk now about genocide as a process. And the final, my own conclusion is beginning 1870s, especially Berlin Congress, 1878, all the way 1923, we have to speak about the genocidal process that targeted not only the Armenians, but Assyrians, even 1890s, and the Greeks and the other Christian minorities or majorities, if you look the ethnically actually, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. It was a genocidal process targeted 1890s, again, Syrians, Greeks, Armenians, and continued beginning of 20th century. None of us learned or know extensively about 1904 massacre in Sassoon area against Armenians and Assyrians. And when we talk more and, and, and research on this topic, we have to talk about really Ottoman genocide or Christian genocide that includes Assyrians, Greeks, and other Christian nations within the This is the Really, technology that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, come on, come on.